Hello, everybody. Welcome to the uh, second of our conference calls uh, regarding the call for presentations for the 2019 Forum on Workplace Inclusion. I'm Steve Hummerkhaus, the Executive Director of the Forum, and I'm really glad to have you all here online with us. Uh, and for what I can tell, actually, probably from all over the world, I see someone from uh, Pakistan on our call list. Uh, welcome. Um, Dr. Kumar, uh, and great to meet you uh, earlier this year. Um, uh, conference call etiquette. If anyone, we're going to keep you muted for the moment uh, until we get to the um, uh, the, uh, the end of the presentation part, and then we'll unmute you for uh, questions and answers. It's so much easier to do that than to do the chat room, of course. But if you happen to be in a loud place and then you want to ask a question, please you know, unmute yourself and then mute yourself again for the answer, uh, just in case, because uh, feedback uh, can be uh, uh, diff make it difficult for us to, uh, the rest of us to hear. Uh, I hope that you've had a chance to preview, uh, review the presentation guidelines and policies and the application itself. We won't be going into a lot of detail on those things. They're, they're pretty much called out in the 15, 16 pages of the guidelines in particular. But we are going to talk about a few of the highlights, of course, uh, that, uh, that come from the guidelines. And we'll, we'll run through the application as well, since it's a new process for us. Uh, so just a quick review of the conference. The forum uh, is, of course, a three-day conference that takes place at the Minneapolis Convention Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And this year, it's going to be April 16th through 18, our traditional Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday lineup. Uh, I, we thought we'd also share with you a bit of um, the demographics from the uh, 20, uh, 2018 conference, which was just a couple months ago, of course. As you can see right in the middle, we had over 1,600 people involved in the forum this year. That's actually 10% growth, which is kind of crazy. Um, it's about 1,500 people more than we had in 2017, which was about 1,500, uh, sorry, 150 more people than we had in 2016. So uh, um, uh, we've seen a lot more people attending. And as you can see, they came from uh, 45 US states uh, and from 15 countries. Uh, all six ha inhabited con uh, continents were, uh, were uh, represented this year, which we're really excited. And people coming as far away as, as uh, South Korea and South Africa and Australia, uh, and places in Europe and Brazil. So uh, that was really quite exciting for us. There were, in fact, 199 presenters this year, including the main stage presenters. Um, and we had 400, almost 500 companies participating at the conference. For 45 of them were Fortune 500s, and happily 54 of them were sponsoring us for, for the 2018 conference. Um, so those are the demographics for um, 20, uh, 2018. Um, we're looking forward to finding out what those demographics are going to be for 2019. About a year from now, we'll know that. Um, so as far as the conference itself, it's, perf it's purpose. Why, why, why do we do this big annual event and having done it for 30 some years? Uh, it is strategic and systemic change. That is what we're about. That's what we're trying to bring about with our mission of engaging people, advancing ideas and igniting change. This is stuff that gets to the core of what happens in a workplace. Uh, and, that's, and that's what we're about. Um, we are indeed a learning conference. Uh, first and foremost, people come to the forum because they want to learn. Uh, and of course, being at a university, that makes sense because that's what universities do. So there's a good alignment there between the University of St. Thomas and the Forum on Workplace Inclusion. We also build community through learning. What we discovered is that in, in the way that we do the learning with small group work and, and um, uh, uh, lots of interaction and co-creation that people actually get a sense of who each other are and what they believe in and and how they relate to each other and that actually builds a sense of connection and a sense of community and that's really important to our learning as it goes throughout the rest of the year not just for the three days of the forum but for the rest of the year they have people that they now know that they can rely on they can call on and say hey i need some help so i got some suggestions what do you think so some of the uh, factors that go into this for our, our attendees are the fact that we are facilitators of learning. All of you who would become pre uh, presenters through the proposal process will be facilitators of learning. The adult learning principles that we're looking for are no lectures, uh, collaboration, interactivity, 
and learning from peers of the co-creation thing that I mentioned earlier. The, the formats that we're looking for are, are highly interactive, small group work, peer-on-peer -peer learning, uh, opportunities to work on plans or ideas, so hands-on types of things, one-on-one uh, -on -one learning fishbowls, uh, world cafes, roundtables, panelists leading small groups, all of that is something that we're looking for. Whatever it takes to activate the learning that the attendees are, are supposed to be making in those sessions. So we know that the brain learns in about 10 minute chunks of information. And if it doesn't then get a chance to practice what it's just heard, it will lose that information. So it's really important to work the pathways of the brain, to build those pathways and exercise those pathways uh, in the in the process of the of the 60 minute session, the three minute, the hour, three hour session, the 90 minute session, whatever it might be. Uh, I'm a musician by training, and I know that in my practice room is where I learn the music, and I have to build those pathways to be able to learn that music. I have to go over and over it and over it until it's automatic, and that's what we're trying to get at in 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 the 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 small group work and all the other things that we try to do uh, within the sessions to build that learning uh, by by having people learn something, hear something, and then repeat it or work it through in their own language so that it builds that pathway in the brain. We want stuff that's applicable to work and practical in its application. And very, very important, no sales pitches. We had a few times this year where we got complaints about some of our presenters who said, stop by my booth and I'll give you more information or buy my book and you'll learn more. That is not what the forum is about. This is a be all in conference. Um, and not only will you hurt your um, scores, you'll, you'll hurt the, uh, the, uh, your reputation uh, if you try to do any kind of sales type things within your session. That's why we have uh, an exhibit floor available to you to take advantage of uh, where you can do your sales. Now, a bit about the actual theme for this year. So we we worked, looked at some business trends that were occurring in society in general, both here in the US and around the world. Um, so we looked at uh, gender pay equity and gender harassment issues, uh, aging or in general, the generations and how they work with each other. We looked at robots and artificial intelligence. Those things are, are popping up everywhere. The environment and sustainability in general, uh, both in the DNI context as well as in the environmental context. Uh, how communication styles happen, which across culturally, uh, the legal issues that are occurring uh, with immigration and migration, um, and then finally, the globalization itself and the trending both toward globalization and then perhaps here in the US, maybe away from globalization. We also looked at um, trending for what's happening in diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And of course, one of those trends is indeed accessibility. What are the issues that are, that are causing causing people to not be able to be fully present in the workplace, and some of those are indeed uh, in the accessibility space. We also know that there's increasing complexity in the work that we're doing, as you can see from the graphic, that that's just touching the surface of it. We also have we know that there are patterns of rehashing the same kind of issues over and over again that we're not solving, but we're just simply talking about things again. People are also looking at personal safety and security. Um, uh, inclusion itself is becoming in the spotlight. We've obviously seen CEOs becoming more active. You can think about Starbucks in that regard. Target is doing similar things internally. The, this, and certainly Target's CEO made major statements at the forum this year on stage um, before the opening general session. Uh, we also know that there are a lot of grassroots organizing that's happening both in the DEIA space as well as in, in political spaces and otherwise. Uh, and then finally, some of the other trends in the DEIA space was that the practice was getting multi-layered, more complex, as I said earlier, and that there was a desire for much deeper learning, really getting down much deeper into what actually is needs to be talked about. How do we actually solve for the issues that we're looking for? So as far as um, design qualities that the forum is thinking about, these are all of the issues that we, we've been talking about 
internally within staff about what are we thinking what 2019 will look like for that matter what 2018 or 17 look like but what will 29 look like some of the things that we're talking about uh, as you can see virtual uh, opportunities the evolution of this of the work um, a deeper introspection about how we're doing the work and what what we're actually doing with it connecting uh, with each other exploring new things and in new ways we're clearly looking for uh, sessions that are not typical I want to be able to challenge our attendees in ways that they have not thought about before so if you have an idea that is really out there um, we might want that idea uh, propose that idea. We've got multiple ways of, of, of uh, exposing that idea, whether it's through a learning lab or a spotlight session, which are going to be one-on-one -on -one or, or kind of like TED Talks in the case of the spotlights, or if you've got a lot of deep exploration you can do with this new idea, a 90-minute session, even a three-hour session might be what we're looking for. But ultimately, um, all of this leads to our theme for the 2019 conference and here are some quotes that kind of give us an idea of where we're where we were headed so your problem is to bridge the gap which exists between where you are now and the goal you intend to reach so where are we what are we trying to do in the diversity inclusion space how can we bridge that gap um, and then to talk about it from the leadership side and as I mentioned earlier between talk and action leaders bridge that gap between talk and action and that, of course, leads us to the theme for this year, which is, of course, bridging the gap, advancing ideas and igniting change. Um, that's the theme. And of course, it covers lots of different things. The forum staff and I sat down when we first were talking about this theme and covered a piece of paper in just minutes with all the different potential gaps that we could think of without even thinking very hard about it. So all of those things are possible. We do, however, have four pillars that we are um, that we are um, kind of balancing this theme of gap on so one of them is the gap between beliefs and values so uh, folks on perhaps on like on the political spectrum people on the left or on the right uh, what a, how do we bridge that gap I talked uh, at the um, opening general session and kind of my opening speech at the 2018 forum about the missing voices that we have in the DNI space that we don't we don't bring in people who don't believe like us and that without them we can't really move forward because they are the equation we're working for if that's the older white male uh, his perspective needs to be brought in or of course we cannot be an inclusive uh, space um, also the idea of inclusion moving it from the gap between inclusion and actually integrating the principles of inclusion into how we do all the things that we do. So processes, uh, practices, systems are all set up in ways that probably represent what we did in the past when things weren't as, in, as, as diverse and or inclusive. How do we change how we do work in all of the ways that we do work, even down to the forms we use, uh, to be able to integrate inclusion and diversity principles into that. Uh, we also have uh, a pillar about in, uh, artificial intelligence versus the insights of humans and, and the perspectives of human beings. Where do we bridge that gap? How do we use technology in a way that helps us move forward without losing the value that makes us who we are as people? And then finally, uh, it be, being able to move from power to empowerment. So people who have power, people who don't have power, using our privilege uh, for those who don't have privilege and being able to empower those people in whatever way that might mean. So those are the four kind of guiding principles that we're looking at for this year's, uh, underlying this year's theme. Obviously, we want sessions across the board, nuts and bolts sessions that have nothing to do with theme are very important because people still need that. It's not like we've suddenly forgotten how to create an ERG. We need that information as well. Um, so uh, we are looking for obviously learning outcomes, identifying these gaps, making awareness of them, uh, guiding us from polarization to effectiveness. If that's a skill building kind of thing and ultimately outcomes and measurements. So how, how do we know we've actually moved the needle? How do we know we've gotten where we wanna go? Uh, and then uh, more specific to the sessions, what are we looking for in those sessions? Uh, obviously, we have levels of learning at the forum, introductory, intermediate, and advanced, and, and in, 
and as a note to the advanced, we need advanced sessions. We have a lot of attendees at the forum who are very advanced in their work. We were looking at the demographics for this year, the number of folks in the director, vice president, C-suite space, moved astronomically this year from what it's been in the past and it's always been good it's always been in like the 30 to 40 percent range of our attendees but this number is much bigger than that uh, and i was just kind of taken aback by it how many folks were in that advanced space so we are definitely looking for sessions that will challenge the most advanced people in the space which of course is a challenge for you as presenters um, and proposers to be able to provide those kind of advanced sessions um, Obviously, handouts are very important. People expect them. Your um, evaluation uh, at the end of the day will go down if you don't provide handouts. Uh, so that's something we're looking for. If you're a consultant, we are, uh, you can see the note about the advanced sessions. I skipped ahead a bit. But uh, if you're a consultant, we're looking for practitioners to present with you. It's very clear from our attendees, as much as they appreciate the broad perspective that consultants bring from all the different industries and organizations they work for, they want to hear from their peers as well. And so bringing practitioners to present with you, or for that matter, encouraging your clients who are practitioners, of course, to propose uh, alongside of your own proposals, that's really important uh, for uh, for um, uh, form presentations. Uh, and finally, the, we have, there are seven different learning styles that we're looking at, and we want to make sure that uh, all those different learning styles are covered in as many ways as possible because we have a lot of folks attending and there are lots of ways that they learn, and we want to be able to help them as much as possible learn in their best way. Um, so we have folks who are visual. Uh, we have folks who learn through a more of auditory process. We have people who are much more logical, so they're looking for graphs and metrics and things like that. We have people who are verbal, like I am. I learn through dialogue. I learn. I don't learn in long sessions. I learn in in conversation. Um, we have people who uh, learn more in a social setting, where they where they. Um, do their own thing about how they find how they learn. We have people who are very kinesthetic, which is what our stretch sessions are about, where people learn through motion or activity being very hands-on. And then finally, we have folks who are solo learners. They just want to do it on their own. They don't, they're not looking for a group. They will just find the stuff on their own. And that's a bit why we're doing learning labs. That's in particularly was created for the solo, the solitary type learner. So that's all, all the stuff about the conference itself, but we also, of course, have this thing called the program committee, which obviously has a great deal of interest to all of you because they're the folks who help me decide what sessions are going, what proposals are going to go forward into sessions. So who are these people? They are practitioners from uh, around the world. Uh, a cross sector of folks from both here in Minnesota and around the US and around the world, as I said. Uh, they come from multiple sectors. I try to balance out uh, people who come from the nonprofit sector versus healthcare versus the different uh, sectors of, of, of business. They come from government. Um, uh, higher ed. Uh, uh, we have folks from insurance. We have folks from retail. We have folks from manufacturing. We have folks from pharma. All those folks are showing up on the program committee trying to get a good cross-section of balance of experience uh, uh, in those people uh, so that so they can be the best advisors uh, to me in their recommendations. So how does this thing work? Well, it's, uh, as you might imagine, a multi-step process. I used to be a federal grant reviewer, and quite shamelessly, I stole the process from the US government uh, working with uh, Health and Human Services. So all your, all your call for presentations proposals uh, are sent to them without revealing information, so they don't know who you are. Uh, we, we strike out all the information that might identify you. Uh, we give them to them in groups. So uh, we divide our 24 folks typically into six groups, uh, uh, sorry, four groups of six, um, uh, and give a, so that they are reviewing about 40 or so, 50 or so presentations, depending on how many we receive in any given year. Um, we also make try to make sure that they get all of the same type of sessions. So all the ERG sessions will go to one group, all the disability sessions will go to another, all the uh, cultural competence sessions might go to a third. Uh, and and so they all all review these proposals and rate them uh, in, a, in a, I think it's a five point scale uh, that we then aggregate. 
so we get a kind of a general idea of what the, the group, the small group thinks. We bring all these folks into Minneapolis uh, uh, in August uh, for a personal meetings, two days of time where we so do some socializing, learn a little bit more about, about the theme and what we're looking for in the conference and the year. Uh, um, uh, and then we dive down into deep work. So uh, on the second day, on the full, on the first full, first on the second day of the conference, uh, the uh, program committee, which is a full day, um, we break them out into their small groups. And here's where the nitty gritty comes because they might have had 40 or 50 proposals to read and, and rate. Now they have to rank them. And we give them maybe seven yeses uh, uh, and maybe seven maybes and a whole bunch of no's. And they have to decide which are the very, very best sessions uh, that they have read. And there's great debate within the groups. Uh, people don't agree, uh, as you can imagine. Uh, and there's trading and, and, and argument and, and reviewing of uh, previous times speakers have, pre have presented and what their evaluations were. Uh, and finally, we get down to the, the, the ultimate answer of, okay, here's my seven. And occasionally we get maybe pluses because, well, they were in the seven, but now I had to bump them down into the maybe group. So that's what happens in August. I, get, I take all those recommendations, I put them into a big, huge master grid and try to balance against 135 topic areas to cover as much ground as possible within any forum to exactly what this conference is going to be about. Uh, using the theme as a guide, using the topics as a guide, using the recommendations as a guide, knowing that I've got nine tracks to work with um, uh, and carving out a conference that tries to cover as much ground as possible and gets to the highest level of, of quality and, and um, practicality uh, uh, for the uh, people who are going to come and participate at the conference. And we'll let you know about the final selections in, our, in November. The process is September and October and November uh, with a bit of August in there too. Uh, and that's kind of where we will leave it for the moment because now Ben is going to, to give you some more information on a much more practical level about the actual proposal process. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Steve, for that very detailed overview of the conference. As I said, I'm Ben Rube, Program Coordinator here at the Forum, and I, I will be going over the more practical and logistical portions of it. Um, we have, as Steve said, we have a very we have new and exciting process here at the forum for your uh, for submitting your proposals. We will no longer have you sub sending your proposals by email. You'll now we set up a. a a website where you will uh, actually create a profile and submit your proposals. So this, so for the 2019, you will be submitting your proposal at um, form formworkplaceinclusion.org/cfp, which I'm going to go ahead and take us to right now, just so we can get again not going to get super deep, but uh, brief, uh, just to, just to show you what the look and feel of this uh, new set, the new submission process. So, 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 uh, like I said, we're gonna go. So you go to this website, uh, the workplace forum, um, workplace forum inclusion org slash cfp. Um, on the site, you will find that you can find the guidelines that Steve mentioned um, to make sure that you've reviewed that. If you haven't yet, you can go ahead and just click here on the website to find the guidelines. And like I said, not gonna go into too deep because it's. Uh, 15 or 16 pages, but yes, this is where you would find it. And once you are, once you've read that and you're ready to submit your proposal, you just click click here to sub, uh, click to be, to begin. Sorry, I get a little tongue tied sometimes. Um, and then you'd go down. And again, we have the important dates or all well, these webinars. So that's kind of a moot point now. But we also have the deadline for the submission and the decision. I guess, like Steve said, will be. Um, made and sent out to you by November 9th or around then. So you go and click your proposal. I've already uh, submitted your proposal. I've already started a, an account. Uh, so I just log into that. Now, if so, uh, since I have already logged in once, it's taken me to this screen, um, which if you, if you get here, if it takes you to this screen, you just click home and then go back back down to submit your proposal again and they'll take you to the app, actual application now with this pre like unlike last year the first thing we start out with this is with your contact information so you'd put you know so things like your company um, 
on workplace inclusion. Uh, title, I'm just gonna do test for the rest of these. Just so you can see what where you're going, That's the United States. Yeah, bless. <clears throat> Minnesota. Five, five, four, four, four. Sure. And we are also new this year asking for uh, any social media information. We would let, we would like you to encourage you to share with your social media platform. Um, you know, that you are going to be doing the forum and your involvement is forum and then a brief bio. You can also upload a headshot if you'd like to have that shared on the website. And then if you want to add any co-presenters, you just click the add co-presenter button and you can add up to four co-presenters. And, that, and, that, and, and remove co-presenters here if need be. So going to go ahead and save and continue. And then this is the section that where you would add the information about your, your actual session. This is this this section is important because this is what the attendees are going to see. So this is the like market how you're going to market your session. What you want to put things in here that will make people want to come to your session. So first and foremost, there's a there are the different kinds of sessions. We have the seminars, which are the three hour sessions, which are usually max occupancy of 25 to 100. It's an opportunity to facilitate that deep dive exploration of a critical topic and or host a half day think tank style discussion. We have the uh, workshop sessions, which are the standard 90 minute sessions, again with a capacity about 125. And that's opportunity to facilitate an informative and interactive workshop centered around a specific industry, critical, relevant, or emerging topic. We have the stretch sessions, which were uh, still relatively new. They are 60 minute sessions with about capacity of about 40, 30 to 45. And it's, a, and it's an opportunity to write a shorter, fast paced and highly interactive session around a topic that jump starts innovative thinking. And we have our 20 minute spotlight sessions, which Steve mentioned are similar to TED Talks. It's an opportunity to present an ex informative expositions on critical cutting edge or controversial topics meant to inspire shifts in thinking or challenge conventional thought. And then lastly, we have our learning labs, which are also relatively new. And these are an opportunity to demonstrate or introduce interactive resources, tools, and innovative approaches that advance thinking and learning duration. And, and learning, these don't have a set um, duration. They can be as long or as short as you want. They're very much more interactive one-on-one -on -one sessions. And then we have the session titles, the session descriptions, obvious, um, obvious things. We have learning outcomes. We need at least, require at least three uh, learning outcomes. Then we have the level of learning. As Steve, as Steve mentioned, they're introductory, intermediate, and advanced. We are looking for more advanced sessions this year. So if you have one, feel free to submit it. Um, then if it is advanced, you fill out the prerequisites. Um, then we have the tr uh, different tracks of learning. Again, this will just this will help attendees choose which like which sessions to go to based on like if you are in if you're a professor or in higher ed, you may you know choose to go to a session in higher ed, or if you're in the government or healthcare, or if you are you know want, wanting sessions with a more global focus, this this will help the attendees determine. <clears throat> and then when we get down to the topic and the presentation in interactivity this is more important for the program committee this is what they are going to be looking at more off like more often than not when they are scoring your session and definitely during direct and definitely during discussion of the session um, so it's very also very important to pay close attention to that section and, and let's see and what to, like what tools uh, models, metrics, processes that participants can apply when they re return from the workshop or result of your session. Again, that helps the program committee decide. Um, as Steve mentioned, ha we, the participants do re or expect handouts. So just, and so just what kind of handouts will you be providing? 
And then the last thing is the for, like just the room set. We just go over the standard room set. Um, it's head table, round table, round table seating with six to eight participants, LCD projector and screen, wireless internet, sound feed for video clips, two microphones, one lapel, one wireless handheld, remote power point slide advancer, two flip charts with stands. Again, this is all very standard. This is the standard room set. Um, they, is, there is variation for the learning lab and spotlights. Like I said, they are a different setup. But if you do need any special, have any special AV requirements other than the standard set, there's a section for that. And also if you have any special ADA needs, um, there's a section for that. As Steve said, accessibility is one of the focuses of the conference this year. So please um, do share, don't be shy about that. And if there's a maximum capacity, like we said, there's this, there's standard maximum uh, capacities. Um, and then any, inform any additional information you want to share, like for example, if you up at the up at the top, you can only choose one of the sections or one presentation type. But however, we have had s people who have submitted for web um, workshops that we've asked to turn to seminars or vice versa, or you know, a workshop that we've asked to turn to a stretch, if possible, or you know, a spotlight that we'd like expanded. So if if your if your session can be altered like that, um, is flexible, then definitely share that in that section. Um, and then, like I said, we ask that you share, if you if selected, we ask that you share that you're going to be participating in the conference on, in your, like, your social media or market it within your network. So we just ask that how you plan on sharing it if you are selected. And some new questions about if you'd like to become part of our uh, cross or I'm sorry, co conference cross-promotional digital marketing toolkit, or if you'd be interested in becoming a contributing writer for the forum on workplace inclusion blog or, the F or other forum publications. Again, all part of our new marketing team. And then at the, at the end, you just use cons I consent and just save and continue. Um, and then once you've done that, it will, it will take you to a confirmation screen and you'll get a confirmation email once that is done. So that is that for the application, the new application process. It's that it's it's really quite it's really quite simple, really um, quite intuitive. If you have any questions or e issues, uh, please feel free to contact me. And let's head back to the slideshow. So now some important dates that are coming up. We, so July 13th is the deadline for the call for presentations. Then we have August 15th through 16th, as Steve mentioned, is the program committee. November 9th is the email notices that presenters are sent. December 12th, the session date and time will be emailed to presenters. Uh, February 15th is the deadline to submit edits to your session. Um, March 1st is the deadline to confirm if you are going to be requesting travel reimbursement or if you would like to forego the travel reimbursement and be listed as a supporting sponsor in our program and on our website. Uh, if you do not confirm by that time, we would just assume, yeah, you're, do not, like, not confirming by that time waives your abil ability to receive either. And then March 29th is the deadline for handouts, which will be emailed to me at RUE06077 at stthomas.edu. April 16th through 18th is the forum. Of, um, and then May 10th, 2019 is the deadline to submit the required travel documents for travel reimbursement, which are your uh, receipts with a form of payment reflected, tax documents, and an invoice for the amount being requested. That being said, we are now going to open the floor up for Q&A. So I'm going to unmute you all now. And so if you have any questions, please feel free to, please feel free to, this is the time to ask them. Any questions?
one thing I would mention, um, almost any, well, anyone who's, who's proposed before knows this happens on a pretty regular basis. Of course, the program committee reads 40 or 50 proposals. I read them all. And you will likely, more than likely, get an email from me asking further questions, asking for clarifications, asking for things that um, I just don't understand because uh, I want to understand them better. My goal is to make your proposal um, uh, as good as it can be uh, so that it can be uh, fully accepted by the committee and as well as me ultimately. Uh, so you're likely to get sometimes just an email, sometimes rounds of email as we go further. And indeed, as Ben suggested, there have been times that I've gotten a proposal that's 90 minutes long and I think it is might be better if we could do a deeper dive and make it three hours long. I've also moved 90 minute sessions into 20 minute spotlights. I have moved proposals from a workshop status to a keynote stage status. So be prepared that there might be some questions I'll ask about, can you do it this way uh, instead of the way you proposed it? Is that possible? And as Ben said, in that last block of space where you can tell us more information about, uh, about the proposal, if this could be a three hour session, but you proposed it for 90 minutes, make sure I know that because that sometimes I have space in places that, uh, that I, uh, I don't have in other, other lengths of time. So uh, it's good to know the flexibility uh, and the ways that the session might be different than the way you proposed it originally. Other questions, any questions? Do we cover it all? I have a question. It's Sorry. more a request. Um, thank you, Steve. This is uh, Mercedes. Nice to hear your voice and thank you. look forward to seeing. Um, when you talk about looking or um, preparing more advanced sessions this year, can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by advanced sessions? And sure. So uh, indeed, because we're looking for them. Um, we have a lot of folks who could probably be teaching the sessions that are in the audience of those advanced sessions. Um, so it, that can be a bit intimidating, obviously. Uh, but I, the key to that, I think, is, is more in the formatting than necessarily thinking that, that this um, information is, is, is not known to the people in the room, perhaps. So it is true that you know, uh, a practitioner in DNI who may have many, many years of, of, of DEI experience may not have experience, for instance, in supplier diversity. So if you, had a, if you had a session that was outside of their typical experience level, whereas they may be very advanced in one space, they may not be so advanced in the other. But, but for the, the practitioners that I've been seeing this happen, we've got a lot of folks in the VP space, C-suite space. Uh, people have been doing this for 20, sometimes 30 years. Um, and, and so they're looking for more challenging things. So some of the ways of doing that is in the format. So in using world cafe models or fish bowls or, uh, um, um, of course, when I need a word, it doesn't come to me, but uh, uh, case studies, there it is, uh, whereby there's not necessarily a correct answer that will challenge them to think outside the box, think creatively, how would I handle that in my organization? Um, so I think in some ways it's the formatting. Sometimes it could be a, a panel situation of, of, of their peers, essentially, who, who can talk about different challenges that they've had. Uh, and so it's, it's more the experiential aspect. Uh, this is how I solved for this problem. Uh, and then of course, with sending context for that to begin with, and this is how I solved for this problem, different panelists go down the line and then challenging the audience to come up with their own ways of solving a conundrum. Um, and it could be on anything. It could be about global aspects. It could be ethics, anything that would cross. Um, we're obviously having a lot of challenges in the political space. How do we bring in I don't know that anyone's got this fully figured out. How do we bring in those those missing voices, those diverse voices that are on the opposite side of the argument from whatever the, whatever's being presented? Um, what, are the, what are ways of doing that? So those are some of the ideas that I have about making sessions more challenging. Um, it may not be necessarily about the content. You know, it may be more about how it's presented that causes them to think in a different way. It could be, of course, something that's totally radically new, in which case, go for it. Um, that would be a challenge as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Sure. 
Hi, Steve. This is Neeru. Hi, Neeru. <laughs> uh, so I just wanted to ask when you said if you're a consultant, it's good to get a practitioner. Mm -hmm. would, you, would you be able to explain that what would qualify as a practitioner? Is it the uh, people who are uh, implementing diversity in the organization? Yes, essentially. Um, obviously, we have a lot of consultants who attend the conference too, who are not presenting. They're coming because it's just great learning opportunities and they're great uh, networking opportunities as well as some other exhibit space on their own. Um, but it's essentially, yes. Yeah. So practitioner though, you know, is broad in the industry opportunities. So it could be someone in government, it could be someone in nonprofit, it could, somebody, could be someone in higher education. Of course, any one of our corporations around the world um, uh, people who are, are basically boots on the ground in that regard, that means they could be managers, they could be directors, they could be VPs, they could be dealing with the strategy aspects, they could be dealing with the tactics. Um, uh, that, yes, exactly. And so in that case, you know, the, the consultant with the broad experience uh, and depth of experience that they have across multiple sectors um, can sometimes bring in multiple co-presenters who are practitioners with a compare and contrast. Um, uh, uh, it, it could be a deep dive into how company X is doing this work. Uh, Khalil Jameson has done some great work in, in, in at the forum with that by bringing in it just happened to remind me because I was, uh, they had a, a representative from Selenese last year who came in and they talked about how they were doing uh, uh, global work across sectors of, of their organization um, and how they were rolling that out. So it's just a great example of saying, okay, here's a company doing really good work. We help them figure that out. Uh, I'm going to set the context of the work and then let them tell, tell the audience how they did it and how does that compare with how you might be able to do it in your organization. So one of the opportunities, of course, is is to give the presentation and then let people work on their own work plan. Okay, this is the information I'm here for. How would I apply that to my organization and actually start the work plan from there? But then you've got the practical application that the practitioner gives. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. It also, uh, something you, in that answer, also made me think about things that would be more challenging for the advanced uh, session. We had this a couple of years ago and I really loved it. We had a panel uh, presentation of CDOs um, and they all didn't agree and they were on somewhat different perspectives as that it basically turned into a very, of course, facilitated, very friendly, but a debate about the issues. And so debate or the compare and contrast to two different ideas would definitely give the, these folks with the advanced uh, experience and information opportunities to chew in some new stuff. Yeah, yeah. To the first Thank question. Thank you. Definitely. Well, I have one question. Yes. Hello? Uh, yeah, hi. I said it is Naomi. Um, uh, if we have a couple of proposals, how can we submit them? Ben, do you want to answer that? Yeah, ju just to check the boxes or just organize answers in one box or? Um, if you have multiple proposals, once mm -hmm. the, you just go back to, let's see. Mm -hmm. Gonna go back to the screen. Yes. Because we definitely want multiple proposals. We have people who mm -hmm. propose seven or nine even proposals <laughs> in any given year. They don't all get selected, of course, but because uh, uh, we do have a usually a ruling of not presenting more than twice. Occasionally, a third time mm -hmm. gets snuck in. But uh, oh, here. Yeah. Yep. So if you are, if you go back, to, if you have multiple mm -hmm. proposals, if you once you've submitted a proposal, mm -hmm. you'd go. If you go to like the home, like my the my submissions. Mm -hmm. And you see, like you see, my draft proposal, the right. the one that I started, and then if you go to home again, uh -huh. you can just do submit proposal and this do submit it and submit another proposal. Okay, another proposal. Okay, yes. that's what I thought. Okay, so multiple proposals. Okay, just repeat. Okay, thank right. you, Pam. And mm -hmm. we're definitely here to talk through, help, okay. answer questions, and of course process. This is a new process mm -hmm. for us as well. So we might all be learning a little bit when we actually get into it to see how it how it functions in real time. Mm -hmm. We have already had a one um, one person submit, I think, three proposals. So it does work. That's yes, good. Yes, it does work. Okay. Thank you. You're Definitely. Welcome.
Other questions? Also know that if you want to talk to potential proposals, ideas you have, I'm always willing to do that. I've got a bit of vacation coming up tomorrow and uh, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of next week, but I'm otherwise, you know, always happy to talk through ideas. Um, I have talked to some of you already, uh, Naomi being one who's just had, had a question. Um, so always happy to do that. Any other questions before we call it and let you uh, pose them separately on your own? Well, we are at actually at time for 45 minutes. So, uh, and you've got some, some social media stuff showing up here for us. Um, otherwise we will, uh, I will look for, Ben will look forward to processing your proposals and I will look forward to reading them and representing them to the uh, program committee when they come to town. Um, and, um, and of course, uh, making those hard decisions for or against some of your proposals, of course. Um, and then we'll hope to see you, of course, in next April. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.